The Provoke Podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Provoke podcast. This is Arun Sudhaman here in Hong Kong. I'm very happy to be joined today by Tori Cowley, who is the Chief Communications Officer at Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing, so basically the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Tori, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, last time I saw you, was in Davos, uh, HKEX, Hong Kong X, HKX. Correct, that'll do. Or yep. three. HKX was quite active as a big Hong Kong delegation. Um, obviously, you know, maybe trying to make the case that Hong Kong is still open for business uh, at this uh, somewhat delicate time in, in, in our history here. Um, how, how, how did you find that week? I mean, how, how well do you think it went from your perspective? Yeah, the snowy hills of Davos. So um, uh, I joined HKX uh, 18 months ago and we went to Davos last year. And obviously pre, pre-protests, pre-virus, mm. uh, pre really the kickoff of the US-China trade wars. Um, so it was a very different vibe last year, um, not only from our perspective, but uh, generally as well. Mm. Um, I think obviously, you know, Hong Kong was front and central this year. Everyone wanted to know what was going on. Um, we were there with a larger Hong Kong contingent than last year. Uh, we had a larger HKEX contingent last year. Um, I think from an HKEX perspective, obviously it's very important that we are seen to be on the global stage. Our competitors are not just Shanghai and Shenzhen, but also London and New York, so, mm. um, um, and a number of other market infrastructure players worldwide. So we want to be part of that conversation. So from a corporate perspective, it was great. And we had a really fantastic uh, week, uh, saw lots of customers, did lots of media interviews, took part in lots of panels. From a Hong Kong perspective, actually, it went really well. I think it was a really, really good opportunity to talk to media, talk to key influencers around the world, uh, give a, uh, a real and live account of what was happening in Hong Kong, not relying just on international media to... Um, encapsulate what they thought was happening. So actually, I think it went pretty well. Um, mm. It's always a really tiring week, but uh, it, was, it was fun. Yeah, it, uh, it's funny you, you mentioned 2019 Davos before all of, all of these things that have happened since then. It, I, I miss those days. Um, but I guess for you, it's kind of thrown up some maybe unexpected challenges for your own role. Um, you know, Hong Kong EX is, is such a critical element, not just of the Hong Kong economy, but even you know the, the, the global economy as well, the second or third biggest stock exchange in the world. Um, how has you know the events of the last 12 months, how has that changed um, the kind of work that you're trying to do uh, to tell the organization's story better? Yeah, um, great question. I mean, you know, uh, doing comms or corporate affairs is one of those jobs that uh, you either uh, have a great appetite for change and uh, issues and crisis or you like the business as usual stuff. Me, I'm kind of in the former camp, so mm. I wouldn't say I welcome it. But actually, in some respects, I, as I said, I joined here 18 months ago and one of my tasks is to try and think about reputation and culture, not just for HKX, but I guess for Hong Kong in some respects, because we are such a proxy for this market in the round. And what the events of the last year or so have really brought to the fore is, we need to think about what's really important for us, what's important for Hong Kong. Um, And so that focus on our purpose, that focus on our values, that really crisp, clear focus on our strategy is super important in the current environment. I think with all this noise, and, and, and a lot of it is noise, some of it's uh, very, uh, uh, very real, but a lot of it is noise. As a comms professional and as a person trying to lead an organization through that, uh, you have to hold, f- hold very close what is true and what is important to you and what is important to your community. So in some respects, it's actually been rather ironically and selfishly quite helpful for me because it's allowed me to talk to the organization internally about what we should be doing from a 
corporate positioning perspective, from a Hong Kong financial markets perspective. And against all that noise, a lot of what you say suddenly becomes very sensible. Mm -hmm. um, so it definitely has, has changed things. Um, in some ways, it's been quite helpful for me, for me in this new role. Um, uh, but without a doubt, it's presented huge challenges. You know, we have to, you know, we're, we operate live markets and two and a half thousand companies are on our market and millions of private investors and institutional investors around the world, uh, trade derivatives, equities, fixed income, commodities. We can't just shut because we're having a bad day. So that has meant that people have been in the office very early for months and months on end to make those markets operate. We have to constantly think about in the current environment in Hong Kong, how we allow companies to come and list on our market when they can't even go out for a cup of coffee. How do they raise funds? How can we help them? Um, and all of that is challenging. Uh, but you wouldn't want a dull life, that's for sure. Never, never waste a good crisis. No, um, right. When you took on the role 18 months ago, was, was this, I mean, obviously these events were not part of your plan, but was your overall plan to try and lift the profile um, of Hong Kong EX? Because I guess from a communications perspective, it has been a little bit, I would say, low profile in the past. Yeah. And certainly that story about how intrinsic it is to Hong Kong's financial health hasn't always been told as well as it could be. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, um, I was brought on, I guess, really, in, in a kind of new role in some respects. Uh, my predecessor used to run a really solid uh, uh, local comms department, but really pr focused on press. Mm -hmm. um, and I was brought in, I, I think, really with an eye on internationalizing the HKX brand, raising our profile amongst our key constituents and stakeholders around the world. Um, but also trying to put in place some foundations for um, this idea of brand, and I'm not talking about just a logo, but how, how we promote HKEX, how we promote Hong Kong's financial markets as a connector between East and West, how we really drive HKEX as a proxy for Hong Kong's financial markets. Um, I think something like 40% of GDP in Hong Kong is made up of financial markets and professional services. So almost anything we do is good for Hong Kong and anything Hong Kong does is, is good for us. Um, so yeah, very much a new role. I now look after such things as CSR, brand events, a, a new foundation, very important for a stock exchange to play a big role in its community. Um, I've built a new internal comms function. Um, we have a new CSR strategy. I sit on the management committee, which is both a privilege and um, um, and I actually believe for any organisation essential to running proper corporate affairs. Corporate affairs is not really a title that's used in Hong Kong very much. Um, it can or cannot include government relations, uh, but it's really much more than just comms. It's a kind of rounded view of reputation externally and culture internally, how you do business, how you make your business perform, how you support the business in the execution of its strategy from an optic perspective. And I kind of guess that's why I've been brought in. Uh, it certainly hasn't disappointed, for sure. Mm, sure. Yeah. And, and obviously, you, you did um, a similar role at, London, at the London Stock Exchange yep. for several years before yep. you came to yep. Hong Kong. Seven yep. years? About seven years, Seven yeah. years, right. Yep. And, and was it a similar process there? Were you, were you setting up a lot of these functions at that time for, for that organisation? Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, stock exchanges are kind of strange beasts. Mm. People think they're quite sophisticated. And in some respects, they are. But actually, I did a very similar role at the LSE when I started. They never really had a head of corporate affairs. Um, I came from running corporate affairs uh, for, for uh, Thomson Reuters and Reuters in EMEA. Um, I moved to the London Stock Exchange Group. But when, again, when I joined, there was no internal communications function. No one looked after the internet. No one looked after the website. Um, and actually, this, I think, is a legacy of stock exchanges the world over. They used to be mutually owned organizations, mm -hmm. owned by their members. They weren't public companies. They weren't set up with a commercial hat on. And as they've evolved, they've demutualized, they've become private. Many of them have listed on their own markets. They have begun increasingly to compete against other financial services institutions. So some of the big investment banks in the world, for example, are our partners, are our investors, 
are our competitors. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very complex um, stakeholder base um, in a higher now these days in an increasingly regulated environment, which brings, that's another top of their own challenges. But what they've had to do, these stock exchanges, they've had to begin to think in a much more commercial way. Mm -hmm. And that means marketing, it means talent management, um, it means regulatory relations, it means government relations. Um, certainly in some parts of the world, market infrastructure have, has become highly competitive. You know, in North America, there's three or four or five or six stock exchanges operating. So how you drive your agenda and your brand is very important. So yeah, very similar. Fascinating in a sort of geeky sort of way. Yeah. Do, you, do you find you have to get, you mentioned, you know, the, the banks and, and that kind of sense of... Um, a sense of shared ownership, if not, you know, technically shared ownership. But do you find you, you need to get buy-in from more partners than, than perhaps you would like, or is, has that changed as well? Um, I think undoubtedly in the last 20 years that has changed. You know, if you asked your parents where they went and bought a share, they would go and say, I bought a share on, on a stock market. Um, Hong Kong's a little bit heavily weighted to equities compared with other stock exchanges, but actually they're as likely to be providing custodial services, settlement services, data services, investor relations services, and actually equities, tra trading equities is no longer just where they make their money. Um, so, the, as I said, their stakeholder base is very, very broad. Um, at the end of the day, you'll never see a stock exchange, or you should never see a stock exchange overly leveraged, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have, almost universally, we don't have any sort of government uh, uh, mandate, and we don't have any sort of special role, apart from kind of, we do. Mm. So, actually, we want the whole community, the financial services community, to thrive. We want it to do well. If they do well, we do well, and vice versa. So if the pie gets bigger, we're very happy. We'll take our extra big slice of the pie. But if the pie gets bigger, everybody else gets a bigger slice of the pie. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, very, it's a very interesting dynamic. It's hard to think of another industry where that kind of plays out in quite the same way. Mm, yeah, I agree. The other thing that's interesting, and you alluded to it, is you are almost a, a nation brand as well, in a way, right? You know, London Stock Exchange really represents London. Yeah. Hong Kong Stock Exchange represents Hong Kong, for better and for worse, yeah. right? I mean, how, has, how do you see that? How has that played out for you in, in the sense, I guess, what's the difference, in a way, between how you've um, experienced the benefits and drawbacks of um, the London brand versus the Hong Kong brand? Well, uh, so for London, I, w I was only operating in one language, which is a, which is a, is a and I only speak really one language. I'm uh, learning Cantonese and I'm terrible. Um, so it is quite strange to be ahead of comms and reputation, all those good stuff, if you don't speak two of the three languages you operate in. So for me, that's one of the greatest challenges. Uh, fortunately, I have a really great, fantastic and patient team here who help me. Um, in Hong Kong. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of organisations around the world that, that hold, uh, hold a country or, or wave a flag um, that uh, identifies themselves with their, their host headquarters. The truth is, actually, most of those organisations have their legacy in a, in a jurisdiction. But actually, if they're public companies, certainly, they're owned by shareholders all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, now, in some ways, that doesn't really matter because I, there's no way that I could ever say to anyone the London Stock Exchange is anything but British. And there's no way I could say the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is anything other than from Hong Kong. Um, but actually, they have shareholders in far-flung corners of the world. And then it's more about the similarities, good governance, strong strategy, um, uh, transparency, um, a belief that technology and innovation and talent are core drivers of your business, um, an ability to see the world in the round and understand your competitive landscape. So all of those are very similar. I think London is, London is a, is a much more heritage-based city than perhaps Hong Kong in some ways. There's more um, financial traditions and there's more legacy. In some ways, that's more problematic because there's more things to evolve and correct or dismantle if you want to move forward. Um, and Hong Kong has its unique uniqueness. I mean, amazing city, incredible uh, place to live. 
um, and a, a unique financial market connecting China, mainland China, with international investors, connecting international companies with Chinese investors, um, and nowhere else in the world can do that. So there is, there is a very special place for Hong Kong. Um, and despite what's been happening recently, um, I'm fairly, you know, in my own little way, confident that Hong Kong will have a very important role to play in the next few decades. Yeah, indeed. I mean, well, last year we saw, was it Alibaba's secondary listing uh, on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange? Was, was that the biggest IPO? It was well, the second biggest, second second biggest last year, yeah. Right. And it's interesting, when you were talking, it made me think that they are, these stock exchanges are viewed almost as national assets, even though they're not nationally owned. But of course, if that does, you, you do get you do get certain responses when, for example, one tries to acquire another and yep. so on. I would know a lot about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. You would, yeah. as we've seen. Um, okay, let's talk about the current conditions in Hong Kong. So we've moved on. Last year's protests weren't enough, uh, clearly, and now we're being tested by the coronavirus outbreak. Um, what are your, if you have any, what are your insights? From a communications perspective, because you are seeing, I think, organizations every day asking, okay, exactly how should I communicate, um, both externally, but maybe even more importantly, importantly internally, um, during this kind of a situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, that's exactly right. I think in, in the current, you know, there's no right or wrong answer for this. And there's, there's very few people who've worked through a pandemic or been through this exact situation. I think one of the things is, if you, if I, you just step back, why do people employ comms directors or heads of communications? It's not because they can write a nice press release, but actually it's often because they've had experience of dealing with dish issues and crisis um, in their previous roles. And that experience allows them to be, you hope, fairly calm and very um, considered in the way they view an environment. And I think um, in the current situation, um, one of the things I think is very important for all organisations, whatever sector you're in, is you cannot respond in a panicked or uh, overly reactive way. Um, you know, there's lots of people involved in this. There's lots of people who are actually experiencing severe hardship as a result of it, whether that's um, further down the supply chain, it's families who, who can't get to work or have lost their jobs as, as a result, or people who have uh, people within their community who are not very well. You know, you have to be very sensitive, but you also have to really focus on, on the way you communicate. Um, you have to balance speed with, with fact. That's the same for any sort of communications. And mm. really, I think it's for, for, for companies at the moment, certainly about my peers in Hong Kong that I've spoken to, you know, is all about um, the internal audience at the moment. Mm. They have to come into work or work from home, a very difficult situation. Uh, we, uh, you know, as I've already said, have to keep the markets up and running. We have to, we can't just stop. It, it's not possible to do that. Um, so listening as well as telling is a really important, not panicking, um, trying to focus on what's really important um, and supporting you know, your peers and your colleagues is another really important thing that we don't talk about very often, but can you, can you help out if you can? And, and um, I think as an organisation, we don't often have a conscience for, for things like that, but I think mm. it's really valuable. In terms of externally, you know, um, we're in a really odd position because actually the financial markets are doing really well at the moment. Mm. Uh, January is about 20% up in volumes compared with this time last year, which is mm. extraordinary. Um, but equally on the IPO front, there's definitely that's um, quietened a lot. Um, that said, we had a listing, I think, today. There was one last Friday. Um, that's 27 or 28 listings this year. We're not even at the end of February yet. By comparison, if I say Singapore, not poor Singapore, but uh, they only had nine listings in the whole year last year. So we've already got 27 in the middle of January against what's been going on. So, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a game of two halves at the moment. We've got very buoyant financial markets, a slowing IPO pipeline. And uh, I just think we've just got to keep our heads down, make sure the markets keep on functioning, wait for that hockey stick someone talked to me about uh, when, it, when it happens. And I believe it will happen because when mm. it all comes right, we, everyone's going to be, I hope it's going to be a very busy second half of the year. Yeah, I hope so too. I mean, I guess 
guess one of the toughest things is just that level of uncertainty mm. now, of, of just not knowing, not being able to provide any kind of insight, guidance, or advice as to when things yep. will return to normal. Yep. Yep. Um, so, yeah, a difficult situation for people, and, and as, as you mentioned, for employees. Um, so let's change things up a little bit. I want to talk to you also about your career to date, because uh, it's quite interesting. I mean, obviously, you have been in the corporate affairs communications world for a while now with HKAX, with London Stock Exchange, Thomson Reuters. Um, you also worked agency side at Powers Court. Yeah. Um, but you didn't start, you don't have a, a, a conventional, what I would call, communications career. You started in corporate finance, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, I'm an accountant by oh, trade. So, okay. I, so this morning, I had a, a hilarious conversation with our new CFO, who said to me, looked me square in the eye and said, uh, well, of course, you're, you're, you're a words person, not a numbers person. And I said, actually, I'm a chartered accountant. And she nearly fell off her chair. Nice. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's a kind of, it wasn't a regular route. Um, actually, the route was I had a job with Bearings on the year that Nick Leeson squandered all the Bearings money and the bank went bust. Uh, I had set myself up a graduate job. I was actually living in Hong Kong at the time uh, with my family. And I had worked with Bearings in London and in Hong Kong. And uh, yeah, some rogue trader bust Britain's oldest investment bank. Mm. So then I slightly panicked and thought, what do I do? So we went off to be an accountant for Pricewaterhouse. And I qualified. I can't, can't say I, I loved it. Um, uh, and I knew fairly early on that it wasn't for me for life. Um, but undoubtedly, it was fa fantastic training. You know, I mean, just, and I definitely wouldn't be doing what I do now without it. You know, mm. I can understand a balance sheet. I understand what m and is. I can tell you about lease accounting or, you know, how you structure a piece of M&A. Um, and actually, for a corporate affairs director, that gives you... Um, Credibility at mm. a boardroom. You know, I, I can I can talk the language that financiers and bankers and lawyers talk, and that's kind of helpful. Mm. Um, so yeah, I did I did that uh, for a few years, and I went off to be an investment banker, uh, M and A, really sub sub one sub one billion mm -hmm. sterling market cap any sector, for, and ended up with Climor Benson. Um, and then I got quite fat and quite lazy and never had a boyfriend. So I went off to go and work for a PR agency and took a 75% salary cut. I was going to um, say, it must have been a significant yeah, pay cut involved. But you know you're single and you know, it doesn't really matter. You don't, I, didn't, I don't think I had a mortgage at that point. Maybe I did. Um, uh, but you know, so it was, so it was one of my, my graduates asked me advice sometimes. And you should never follow the money. And, I, and that's why I genuinely believe that. If you're good at what you do, you're passionate at what you do, you enjoy what you do, the money follows you. It really does follow you. So, you know, I, uh, and I knew almost straight away when I went to PR, not ever having spoken to a journalist before, so they took a bit of a, a bet on me, uh, that this was my, you know, it was, it was, it's that confluence of business and politics and strategy and people and risk and, judgment and planning and immediacy, pace, were all mixed up. Um, you get even more of that if you work in-house than you do an agency, actually, oh, uh, okay. uh, because you feel like you're driving the engine. Um, mm. But yeah, so it was, it was not a, it's not a regular route. But I don't think regular routes are good, necessarily, mm. in corporate affairs. Mm -hmm. the best, some of the best people I've ever worked with in this, in this capacity had, don't come from a journalism or marketing background and I'm not belittling that I mm -hmm. once worked with a fantastic guy and he's a ballet dancer by trade mm -hmm. and when you look at a team or good team whether it's an agency or in-house good teams are diverse teams and they come they're ex-bankers they're ex-sales people they're ex-journalists they're ex-marketeers they're ex-content writers they're ballet dancers whatever mm -hmm. they are and that variety and diversity of thinking for running a team in terms of reputation I think is absolutely absolutely critical mm. you can't just hire x anything x yeah. you know pr people or x journalists or x marketers you need everyone to kind of pitch in when it's interesting you talked about talent just now and w when we um, when we research the industry for example one of the questions we often ask is where do you hire from and it's always either rival agency another in-house comms department uh, journalism. Those are the top three. Uh, I mean, how much of a challenge is this? Is why is the industry not not looking outside of these areas often enough? Do you think? 
Um, it's a really great question. It, I think uh, there's a couple of. I, I think there's probably a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it's safe and easy to go and recruit from those tried and tested grounds. Um, you know that people have got a bit of experience of what you do, so that's fantastic. Um, the other one I think is is a bit more nuanced. Is if you go and hire someone in a finance department or a law department, a professional department, you can very clearly see that they've got a law degree or an accountancy qualification. What is PR? What is comms? What does that mean? I mean, what am, what am I looking at? I'm not even sure from a CV I can tell that. Um, and so why are people reluctant to go elsewhere or not elsewhere? Because there's no standardisation. I'm not, I don't think there should be a standardisation. I don't think having a PR qualification or comms is the, is the right approach. But I do think in the world that we live in, with the immediacy of, of, of the, the environment we operate in, so, and that's been driven by all things digital and social, that that diversity of thought and that collection of skills is so critical for managing reputation and driving culture. I don't think you can do it unless you have people who are think differently. And one of the pleasures of being a comms director is you sit around the board table or management committee and often you do see things in a totally different way to everybody else around the table. And that's really valuable. That's really, really valuable. And what you can't do is just because you're a comms director is uh, capitulate. You've got to be able to say, actually, I disagree with you and mm. have the conversation. Um, because the reality is not always what people see. And um, as much as we would like it to be the case. Um, so when you're putting a team together where I recruit from, I am looking for attitude. Mm. I'm looking for an inquisitive mind, mm -hmm. tenacity. A uh, good sense of humour doesn't go amiss. Um, I'm looking for people who are different to me, who are often better than me, who uh, are going to say, really? Quite often. Um, who have ideas. I'm looking for people, other people who are absolutely machine-like and can spot a typo at 400 miles away. Um, I'm looking for people who really want and are fascinated by this interplay of lots of different strands. And that can manifest in lots of different ways. Mm. But it's a challenge. I have interesting conversations with HR departments about how and what I recruit. Yeah, it, it, it's almost PR. You said, what is PR? It's almost the way you describe it. It's a, it's a state of mind almost yeah. Yeah. rather than a um, qualification. Although yeah. we have to say there are many universities now that do provide yeah. these kinds of qualifications. Um, but, you know, I, I sometimes think of it in terms of journalism um, as well. You know, you, you'll often find, I think, uh, editors and so on who, who, who want to hire reporters who, who may, maybe don't have mm. a, a journalism qualification. It's not necessarily the best or only route no, it's into that the business. freshness of thinking. Mm. It's, it's that ability to challenge the status quo. And actually in PR, what, what is PR? We, really, with salespeople, I mean, people would be horrified at that, but you sell a product, you don't lie, but you take what you have and you package it in the best way that you can mm -hmm. and that you have to understand your audience you have to know what mm. you're saying you have to be have a, a, a clear mind you have to be able to cut through all the all the rubbish and get to the stuff that's really important and that's not going to be proven to me by someone who's got a start first in astrophysics any more than it's going to be proven to me who's someone who's got a you know a, a, you know who's run a desk at a major international newspaper it is the person and the way they think and their and their their, uh, their ambition for what they want to do actually they, mm. that doesn't mean they have to be ambitious mm. but um their passion yeah and actually putting a team together is, I think, a real art as well, because mm. what you don't should never do, and, and it's very cliche, but don't hire all of the same type of people. You need, yep. you need if you've got a hole in a team or a headcount to fill in a team, you've got to think, well, what did my team need? Do I need a stabilizer or do I need someone who's going to, you know, come up with the ideas? Irrespective of the functional role, mm. um, do I need a, a live wire or do I need a sort of quiet person? Mm. Um, and you can't go and recruit for a quiet person but you kind of know what you mm. want i like putting teams together i think yeah. it's deeply fascinating how hard is that here because so, you know we always hear about the the big talent crunch yeah. in asia and, and this is where you see so much cannibalization in this part of the world mm. people moving roles every year because of that demand have you found it more difficult putting together that team here 
No, I, I inherited a good team. I was here, have mm. been here 18 months. Uh, there's been some natural attrition and we've hired a few good people. You know, Hong Kong presents its own challenges. It's very, as you said, very high employment here. So there's people that are not scared to move regularly. So that, that is a challenge. Um, certainly, if you look at uh, Hong Kong people, mainland Chinese, Guaylos, they bring different things to the table. Um, uh, and I think if you work for an international organization especially, you need a mix of all of those things. Um, mm. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, I don't think, you know, speak to any manager of any, in any discipline, and actually an awful lot of their time is taken up in managing the team and thinking about the dynamics of that team and how that team can work better, uh, rather than their functional role. Mm. Um, but again, that's another example. No one gives you training for that. And there's mm. some people are naturally good at it and others right. who are not. But um, I, uh, yeah, no, it's fascinating. But it's the human, this human spirit, isn't it? It's human nature. It's, yeah. it's, that's really what it all comes down to. Yeah. Not a specific question about your mm. accountancy background. Mm. Do you think the industry, I say the PR industry, the mm -hmm. corporate affairs, needs to become more numerate? Uh, certainly in the corporate world, yes, mm. I do. Um, so my, probably my best friend still, she, uh, she lives on the other side of the world and she doesn't work anymore, but she used to work in consumer PR. Mm. And we used to laugh because we had the same job, but actually we didn't have the same job at all. So she used to work in luxury goods. So uh, she'd spend her life speaking to Vogue, trying to get them to feature Lauren Perrier champagne or some fancy new watch. Um, do, does she need to be an expert in M&A? No. Mm. But actually, I think the world needs to be more numerate. Mm. Um, I don't think it's just PR. I think uh, we, we have a big campaign here at HGA. It's financial literacy is one of our CSR uh, um, focuses. And whether you're budgeting for the household budget or you're working out how much money you need to retire or you're um, operating a small investment portfolio, we all need to be more literate here, mm. uh, numerate um, uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, we don't need to be rocket scientists, but if you can't plan for your future, you plan, you keep your body healthy by going to the doctor and playing sport, but your financial situation is what's going to ensure that you have a comfortable life. Mm. And, uh, and there's plenty of very clever people I know who, you know, don't know how to take out a mortgage or, you know, really, really struggle. Mm. That's somewhere, I think Asia's probably a bit better than, than Europe, but I think somewhere are numeracy education is is failing mm. okay well tori thank you so much you're welcome for your time this was um really enjoyable and i feel like we covered a lot of ground good luck thank uh, you. with everything that's going on at the moment um thank you all for listening uh, we'll be back soon you've been listening to the provoke podcast brought to you by provoke media and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers.